This is you, or rather who you've become. You are who you've become because of your choices, circumstances, past, relationships, parents, or lack thereof. You, your life story up to this very second, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's how you've become who you are. This, however, is who you were created to be, alive, complete, fully free who you are, deeply rooted in who God is, using your gifts, talents, passion, and resources to be God's hands and feet in this world. This is the you you've caught a glimpse of in your best and worst times. This is the you that you've been created to be. The distance between these two yous sometimes feels impossible to travel. The process to bridge these two yous is called transformation. It's the way that God helps you go from who you've become to who He created you to be. It's sometimes painful, sometimes difficult, sometimes slow, sometimes welcomed, sometimes not. But it is always loving. It is always what God longs for. It is always for everyone, including you. Our church exists to help lessen that gap. Transformation is something only God can do, but our church can help to make what is undeniably spiritual as practical as possible. From what we teach, to the things we do, to when we meet, to who we do life with, we are committed to helping you grow, to helping you become who God created you to be. That's transformation. That's our church. Minding Our Minds, um, part four. This is part four of a series that um, we started well, four weeks ago, right? <laughs> this is part four. And so, um, as we've said before, transformation begins in the mind, and um, which actually is our brain when you look at the physical part, the physiology of the human being. Um, you are also designed to interact with other brains. Can you believe that? That's really, when we say minds, even when Paul is saying that we are renewed by the, you, you know, we're changed, be retransformed by the renewing of your minds, that, that is a function of your brains and your emotions. And that's, we're going to kind of get into that a little bit today. But I want to point out at this point that you are designed to interact with other people based on your brain. Scientifically, that's been proven that you are designed to interact with other people. Uh, it, transformation is the process that God uses by including others into our lives to help us on our journey of transformation. But there are signals from brain to brain, not just verbal signals that are necessary that God uses as we get into all of this and as we do this. But before we get into this, how many of you took our challenge last week? Ooh. So how did you do on this first one? For those who need to subtract, how many, how many of you did a one-week fast? Uh-oh, I see some thumbs down. Didn't quite make it. All right. That's cool. That's all right. <laughs> but... Um, um, for those of you who tried this, I mean, how difficult was it? I mean, hard, kind of medium, easy? Easy. Oh, wow. Okay. Easy. And it's, it, it's, it's not just, a, this is not just a, um, it wasn't just a challenge for you to stop you from doing what you normally do. But it was a challenge so that we can um, just take a look at our minds and see what we are doing because uh, social media is designed, in, in, not initially, but it is designed to actually pull you away from social interaction, even though it's called social media, it pulls you away from all of your social physical human contacts, which are unnecessary and pulls you into a realm where 
you're really being fed whatever, in some cases, whatever they want you to see and hear and think um, and all of that. But I'm glad that you did okay with that. The second part of that was practice paying attention and engaging while communicating. How many were, uh, okay, all right. I mean, with, with your, some of our biggest challenges with those are with, if you have kids or grandkids, um, you know, those, those are some of our biggest challenges is we, we're not engaged when they're talking to us. We're just kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, spouse, friend, the same way. But anyway, um, one more for the people who need to, com to subtract. Think of one connection we ask you to do whom you would typically text, message, or Facebook and choose to stop by or pick up the phone or write a letter. I'm like, ooh, that's got some hands on that one. Yeah. Um, I took this particular challenge also, and I mentioned to you last week that there had been a gentleman that was a part of, he's always online, many times he's online if he's uh, not busy uh, on Sunday mornings and and you, if you've been online with us, you'll notice he, his signature is boots on the ground for Jesus. Um, and um, he reached out to me a year ago when I was really going through after the loss of our son and online. So uh, yesterday we talked on the phone. Yes. And next week we're going to meet in person. So... You get to see how that kind of works. I mean, for a year, all we did was interact online. And then all of a sudden, one week from today, we'll be meeting in person. Um, so use social media to actually engage and build relationships, uh, not to just be stuck in online only, but use them to actually get. Now, for those who need to add social media. Just for this week, we asked you to do some research based on your reasons. That's all you had to do for this first step. You didn't have to reach out to nobody, just do some research to find out, um, you know, why you're not online or why you don't participate. And I don't expect you to give me your reasons uh, right now, but if you want to share those, uh, because we have to learn how to mitigate and get rid of the fear or whatever it is that's controlling us. We should not uh, allow fear to control us. When there are some ways that online, even social media can be helpful. And next week we may look at some of those. But the last thing here we ask some of you that need to add is as you go through your week, think of one person you don't engage and see if they are on social media and reach out and begin a relationship. Did anybody do that one? Okay, all right, reach out, amen, amen, good. Um, the challenges are working, <laughs> thank God. So as we get into today, though, minding our minds, um, if we're going to embrace transformation, and that's what this series is about, embracing transformation, embracing every facet of what it takes for God to transform us. God is transforming us, and he's using everything that he can, everything that's around us, God uses that to benefit and to move us towards the image of Jesus Christ. But we need to understand the answer to um, the question, why do we need to be transformed? If you were talking to somebody, they'd be like, well, why do I need to be transformed? What's the purpose of transform? Um, you know, um, so we want to look at that. But in order to even answer that question, we need to answer this question from several different perspectives. That is from, and not just a biblical perspective, that's what I want to key in on, but from the perspective of how our minds actually impact our being, how our minds impact our daily living. Jesus did say, and this is from the Bible, but Jesus did say, I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. Not just eternal life, not just life after leaving this earth, but life itself, the very source of what gives you the energy, you know, to live life. Jesus is really the source of that. So even if you don't believe in creation, even if you don't believe uh, in God, it is scientifically proven that we somehow, 
So, I mean, I know that I believe that God created us this way, but even if you don't believe, somehow we have the hardware in our brains and the software in our brains that we need love, that we need relationships. We are designed that way, and God wants us to engage in that and actually to embrace that as a part of our transformation process. And so when you look at um, the image and the model of transformation, love is at the top of that list. That's the whole motive for being transformed is because God loves you and he wants that love in you that he's given you to be spread to any and everybody else. Everybody else you touch, everybody that comes across your path should feel God's love, not your wrath. (laughs) That just popped in my mind. (laughs) Everybody that you touch should feel God's love, not your wrath. And that's what God wants us to do. And so um, I have a question for you to get started this morning, and that is this. How do we as human beings connect with each other, and how do we feel? How do we um, generate feelings? Uh, For example, as you're thinking about this, uh, I can I can pass by you as a stranger, and this is how God's designed us. Never saw you before, never talked to you before, and in your presence, I get some kind of feeling when I'm right in your presence, and that's a feeling we get. And what is that? It's a reaction, but what what? I mean, God designed us that way, but what does this? I mean, connections are feel. I think about, I think about, um, it was not long after Thomasine and I first got married, and she was asking me questions, and Thomasine is a psychotherapist, and you're going to get to meet her a little more today. We're going to uh, bring a couple of uh, people on the stage to help me with this, but when she first started asking me how I feel about something, I would start talking, and she would stop me and say, um, you're telling me what you think, not how you feel. And I had such a hard time with that that she brought home one of these. <laughs> she says, okay, these are feelings. <laughs> <laughs> these are feeling faces, okay? These are emotions. There are more than these, but these are basically some of the major emotions. And I started thinking about these facial expressions that we have. And what I learned is that these facial expressions, almost all of them are, they don't depend on your language. You can look at other people from other countries and any of these faces, they're, they're actually speaking to you of what's going on in their emotions, which is very, very powerful. And it's a way that God's given us to communicate with each other to the point where even if I don't know your language, even if I can't speak intelligently and share with you, you know, intricately with what's in my mind with words, our faces talk to each other. And so these facial expressions are independent of any visual uh, experience. And studies show, and this is, this is very powerful right here, studies show that blind babies, now listen to me real good now, blind babies learn to smile. They can't see. Never seen anybody smile, but the muscles from their, based on the limbic resonance in their brain and the muscles that's speaking to them, they learn to smile in response to the sound of either their mother's voice or their father's voice and something, that's what's called limbic resonance, that you're the part of your brain that actually communicates with other brains. That's why a blind baby If you come up and smile and start talking to them, they never saw anybody smile before, but the corners of their mouth start going up. 
They don't go down. I mean, think about it. They could go down. But they go up. God's designed us that way. And that's called limbic resonance. That's a state of deep emotional and physiological connections between two people. And we all have it. You do it whether you realize it or not. Some people, you get in their presence, and without them saying a word, they're already getting on your nerves. It's <laughs> and some people, without them saying a word, you feel like, man, I'd like to get to know them better. But we each have a limbic system in our brain, and all the time we catch different emotions of other people. Um, and not just emotional, physiological states. We, we catch them. We, when I say physiological states, sometimes you can be in the presence of someone else and it causes your heart rate to change. So just being in somebody else's presence impacts your blood pressure. I remember once, <laughs> somebody said, mm. I, re <laughs> I remember uh, one time, and I was spending a lot of time with my wife because she was going through her battle with cancer, and we was visiting the doctor, it seems like, at least every month almost for a while and more often. And one thing she did not like is getting her blood pressure checked because it was always high. It was higher at the doctor's office than it was at home. Anybody else deal with that? And so um, she had, in one case, she had gotten um, her uh, blood pressure checked, and without me being there, and then the next time I was with her, and the doctor said, oh, because she's got this nice gentleman beside her, and blood pressure is down. But anyway, <laughs> it, <laughs> it does help when you have the right person in your proximity that is rooting for your health, rooting for your mental health, your physical health, your best, want you to be your best self, speaking good words to you, it impacts your health. Believe it or not, it impacts your health. So here's a question for you. How important to God is your mental health and your mental well-being? How important to you is your mental well-being of others? How important to you is the mental well-being of others to you? Think about that. Because remember, your thoughts inform your feelings. Listen to me. Listen to me. Your thoughts inform your feelings. So if you think a certain way about a certain person because of some history, you're going to feel a certain way about that person even if you wished you didn't. Your thoughts inform your feelings. So even if you feel a certain way about a person, it's because of what you think about them. Even if you want to feel a different way about them, you have to learn how to think a different way about them. Um, and your feelings, along with some other information and experiences, inform your beliefs. Now you gather what you really believe. And so if, if, whatever, if that person gives you enough experience that validates what you were thinking, now you're, you're developing some beliefs about that. And then your beliefs inform your behavior. So then you're going to act a certain way around that person. And if you begin to behave a certain way and practice that behavior long enough, that becomes what? A habit. And habits over time is what forms your character. That's who you are. That's who you become. That's why we need transformation. And we need to engage our minds all the time so that we're, we realize we're forever being transformed. This month is 
National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, the month of May is National Mental Health Awareness Month, but um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services have put together, a, they believe that we need a special attention to this, and the month of July is the National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. So I'm going to invite two psychotherapists to the stage to help me with the rest of this message. So Dr. Thomasine Wortham and Dr. Miriam Taylor, as they um, come and join me in this message. Uh, again, as they come, let's give them a big hello. <laughs> So I, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Wortham to introduce, first of all, honey, tell us about yourself. You, you, I mean, I call you Dr. Wortham and I lived with you, uh, you know, but um, tell us about your credentials and who you are. I'll, I'll let you do that. And then introduce Dr. Mary. I am Thomasine T. Wortham. Notice I didn't say my name is Dr. Wortham. You know, a lot of people say my name is Dr. So-and-so. <laughs> that's not their name, that's their title, right? <laughs> but uh, anyway, I am uh, by profession a psychotherapist, and that's really a generic term. It could be a psychologist or other uh, mental health professional who does therapy, but by um, profession, I'm a social worker. I have a master's in social work, a bachelor, a, a BA in English, um, and a PhD in human services with a specialization in counseling studies. So people, people, people. And I love what I do. And we'll talk more about that. Okay. Introduce our guest. And to my left is Dr. Marion. And I, <laughs> I call her um, Dr. M, affectionately sometimes Dr. M, but um, she's a highly qualified clinician and she's also highly qualified in ministry. Um, by profession, her specialty is family therapy and then she also has a doctorate in ministry, correct? And so we have been, uh, she actually brought it to my attention that we were observing um, minority mental health this month. And so we wanted to be sure to get this in because it's so critical, especially um, in church and especially, um, I shouldn't say especially, but we're focusing on uh, minority mental health, which includes um, African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, and the Hispanic or Latino group in particular, because there's some things that are unique to us. Amen. So I have some questions for both of you. And uh, the first question is this, why is mental health important? And I don't know who wants to go first, but. Hello, I'll go <laughs> first. <laughs> Uh, Pastor Woody, you already said it in your sermon. Mental health is important because mental health really is about our minds and the functioning of our minds. And since we think a thing and then we feel something about that thing and then we act on that thing, our minds need to be as healthy as possible so that we make healthy decisions um, about ourselves, about the people we are around, so that we make good choices, mm. you know, for our lives, for our families, so that we make good choices in relationship. Our mind impacts everything about us. Our physical health, the foods we eat, the places we go, the things we do, it does start in our minds. So we need our minds to be as healthy as possible. Amen. You said it well. <laughs> what else, what can we do without engaging our minds? You know, even if we are aware or unaware, because so many things we do unconsciously or subconsciously, but um, we have to mind 
our minds. And you know what I was thinking about uh, since you started the series, Pastor Woody, is we also have to mine our minds. Am I any? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to go in and dig and dig up stuff that's in our minds that we don't realize are affecting us. And so we also have to mine our minds. Amen. That's good, because some stuff is deep down in there, just like diamonds and yeah. gold. You got to go down deep and, and uh, work that out. Okay, next question for you is, what issues are unique to minorities as it pertains to mental health? I have a brief answer, and then I'll let Pastor Thomas C. Uh, finish it. The things that I see a lot are anxiety and depression. Mm. And whether you want to admit it or not, it is stressful just to be alive and interact with other people and live in the world. So I see anxiety, depression, and stress the most. I totally agree. It's um, When it comes to anxiety and stress and those things, it's, you know, stress is just real. You know, stress... There's even good stress, like excited about getting married. So, but there's stress involved, and so um, <laughs> there is. I mean, there's so many details, so many personalities, and that's just one example. But we have that regular stress. But then, Dr. Miriam, how about that stress we have living in this skin we live in? So, racial trauma is so real and so with the anxiety and the stress that we would typically have now we have uh, and have had since the plantation racial trauma and living in this world today with all of the things that we deal with uh, indirectly you turn on the news and somebody's been murdered somebody's been shot and then the, pr the whole dynamic with the police brutality issues and all of that. And so it's just living in the skin. A lot of times we say, and jump in, uh, Dr. Miriam, a lot of times we say in the body of Christ, um, well, just pray. I've had clients who have been so wounded because somebody said, where's your faith? Why don't you just pray? You don't need therapy, you just need to pray. And I was so glad when I saw that um, slogan that said, it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. <laughs> Say that again. It's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. <laughs> what you think about that, Dr. Mary? <laughs> I want to piggyback on that a little bit because, again, Pastor Worthen said it in his sermon today. Right. People need people. And as much as some of us want to think that all we need is Jesus and we, and we do a lot of religious talk, you know, how are you today? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, and you don't feel that way at all, right? right. Um, <laughs> and, the, and we often say that, you know, Jesus is enough. I got Jesus, and I'm, that's enough. But the reality is that oftentimes it's not, and that's okay. I was thinking about that today on the drive-in today, and I was thinking about how I personally love, I'm in love with Jesus. And I love God, and I'm so in awe and honor of the Holy Spirit and his indwelling in my life. Yeah. But I tell you what, I'm a person living in the skin on earth, and my human side, man, I need somebody to talk to sometimes. I need somebody to listen. I need somebody to pray with me. I need somebody to touch me. Like my sister just came in. She knew I was doing this, and she knew I don't like being in front of cameras. <laughs> and it's helpful for me to see her looking, I think, because every time I look at her, she smiles. <laughs> like she's reminding me, smile, Mary. You know. <laughs> but it's helpful to have somebody to reach out to and touch. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're human people living in human skin. Right. And it doesn't mean that Jesus isn't enough. It means that our human side oftentimes needs a special touch or a human touch. Yes. And it's okay to reach out to somebody when you are in need of help. Yes. If you're sick, you go to the doctor eventually, right? Yeah. So if your mind is not right, why you don't have a therapist? Exactly. Why don't you get your mind right? <laughs> yeah. No, really, exactly. get your mind right. right. Mm -hmm. Get your thoughts right. 
get it lined up with the word, and then your, your behavior will begin to change because your thoughts are going to impact how you feel. And as you said, you know, your feelings are going to impact your actions. So it's really important to know who you are. And if you know that you're a person who needs a human touch, make sure you have your support system lined up when you feel good. Yes. Because when things are not well with you, <laughs> it's really hard. It is. It's yeah. hard to pull that up. Exactly. Like, who am I going to call? What am I going to do? Who am I going to go see? Have that listed. I often, when I was working at a school in New York City briefly, I worked with girls, all girls, 624 girls, and I was a school counselor. And I would tell those girls, I need you to have a list. You know, they walk around with their phones even though they weren't supposed to have their phones out. But I would say, create a list somewhere in your phone of the things that make you happy. On my list, it's always popcorn and it's always yes. popsicles. Yeah. Because I'm a popsicle girl, right? Yeah. And I'm a popcorn girl. But I had other things too. I had the names and phone numbers of people that I knew I could call and just say, listen to me, talk, pray with me, pray for me, meet me here, meet me there. So that's another way of having right. you know, your support system ready and being able to admit that you need a human touch and then preparing for that when you need that. Amen. Admit, that is so key. Admit, a lot of times we don't want to admit that. I wanted to just make one more point about the uniqueness of this African-American or black experience because again, everything that you share just, just in those moments is so amplified for us because of our experience as African Americans. From a spiritual standpoint, even we probably heard teachings where people will say, well, uh, I'm a spirit, so I don't have a color, so to speak. You know, they don't, don't pay attention to the color. Now, it's true, we are body, soul, and spirit, but this spirit lives in a black body, and this black body has to function in this society. And so as believers, we need to be real balanced about that, Pastor Woody, because mm -hmm. we can get so deep that we deny the human, as you were mm -hmm. talking about, the human experience, and act like it doesn't apply. But we can get some real reality checks that let us know that it does apply. Amen. Amen. And that is, that is real. I'm going to go on to the next question um, that I would like for you to, to answer. And that's, what does a therapist do in a therapist session? Just so that people can realize and recognize what it is. Understand, what is it that you do? You know, one of the things that's important to know is that as therapists, we're not here to tell people what to do. We're here to lead people help them identify how they want their lives to change. And that's really what therapist, therapy is about, is change. And so in so therapy- So that's transformation, right? Transformation. Mm. Transformation, okay. changing the way we think, changing our choices, changing our behavior. Mm -hmm. And so we, sometimes I compare what we do to what the Holy Spirit does. We lead, we teach, we guide. We help um, people heal using words. Mm -hmm. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. We help people heal using words. And those of us who are believers use the word of God along with our theory and all the training we get. And so we build relationships, we connect, we build trust, we create a safe place for, for people to be real. And that's what should happen in a therapy session. I view myself as a spiritual midwife in my therapy. I always um, invite the Holy Spirit into the session. Clients may not know that, but that's my preparation before I talk to them. I'm asking God to infuse me with the Holy Spirit so that I can be perceptive enough to help the person pull out of themselves what they need to pull out of themselves because I'm a believer that most of us know what we need to do. And most of us know what is best for us. We might not consciously know it, but if someone will listen to us talk, we'll talk ourselves right up on it. Yes, and so if I can be 
present with them during that time and coax them and encourage them to go inside, as you said, you know, Pastor Woody, and allow themselves to feel whatever it is they're feeling and say whatever they, they need to say in a safe space where it's not going any place, no one else is going to hear it, the information is safe, the, the, you know, you create that safe space between you, people will talk themselves up on their own solution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they need ideas. You know, have you thought of this? You know, have you thought of that? We do a lot of that. You know, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? We do a lot of saying, what do you feel? And I laughed <laughs> when Pastor Woody showed that picture with the feeling words because I'll give you a thought in a minute. If you ask me how I'm feeling, I'll give you a thought. I'll also give you a list of the things that I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> and it takes me a minute to pause and say, okay, what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. And how am I feeling? Because that's not the norm. Most people don't care. <laughs> you know, we have, I don't, I hate this colloquial, this colloquialism, um, how are you today? Like people would say, hi, how are you? Don't say hi, how are you to me? <laughs> I'm not going to answer you. You gonna tell us? Well, no, yeah. most people don't want to know. Right. So they'll say, hi, how are you? And they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> well, why did you ask me how I was? And, and you out the door already. <laughs> yeah. You know, because we don't really want to hear how people are. Right. We don't pe want people to really tell us how they are. But in therapy sessions, it's just like this. We sit and look at each other, create a safe space, get quiet so the person can go inside and feel what's inside. We allow them to cry, we allow them to talk, and we allow them to sit in silence. Now people think that's nothing. I remember having a client who couldn't put words to her feelings, and she sat in front of me with her arms crossed for 45 minutes, two sessions. It was her time. She bought the 45 minutes. I mean, I am providing a service. I sat with her. That's all I did mm -hmm. was sit with her, and I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. She came back. She did it again. The third time, I think she put a cloth over her face or something, and I said, okay, time out. We're not doing that yeah. because you're not going to hide behind your feelings. And I coaxed her into using words. And it transformed her That's over powerful. time. She wow. never, ever had anyone sit with her for 45 minutes twice. Just sit there. Yeah, and that's, that's so important because the silence is many times where the healing takes place. And what we do most of the time, much of the time with our lives is we, we're busy, we're in motion, we're moving, we're moving, we're moving, and we don't know that we're avoiding that the movement is allowing us to avoid. And so when we get still and those things start to rise up, then we gotta do something. We have to do something with our hands. We have to do something with our brain. We gotta do something. But the power of sitting in that silence is so, so important. And, and also, you know how in, in therapy many times when there's, um, I'll say it this way, there, there's no dynamic, because there should be movement in a, in a session, even in the silence. A lot of times what we do is we, we have to bring things from the outside, which is where people live. And we talk about homework a lot. We give homework because change happens out there. Just like in, when we hear the word of God, and we're in this kind of bubble here, and we're hearing the word and all that, then we go out there where we live, and, and we talk about Satan come immediately to steal the word. Well, therapy is much the same. In therapy, and you're learning, and, and you're, you're growing while you're in there to a degree. But then when you go back out there, and everybody else is the same, because they're not in therapy with you. And then now the test is, will we do something different out there so that our lives can change? And so that is so important, because it's in that silence that we can many times hear on a whole different level. Amen. I did want to say this, because sometimes people are afraid of us. <laughs> As therapists, we are 
behaviorist, okay? And if you think about it, it's not so uncommon. You know, like psychics oftentimes can tell you things about yourself by looking at you, watching you walk, watch how you sit, watch how you hold yourself. We can too. I mean, I know I could tell you it's a problem with your hip. Oh, she has a problem with her knee. Oh, she's probably got problems with her feet. You know, you can tell different things about people by watching them. But we're not trying to analyze you 24-7. Right. We're not interested in doing that. We get paid for what we do. So on our private time, in our private moments, we're not doing all of that. <laughs> you know, we're people. We like to laugh. We like to have fun. We like to enjoy life. So you don't have to be afraid of us because we have these particular types of skills and we can read human behavior. Because I promise you, most of the time, we're just not interested in reading yours. And if we do read it, we're not going to tell you. You know, we don't walk around and look, I, let me tell. No, 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 no. That's not appropriate. We're so you trying to relax. do a brain dump. Right. We're trying to let our brains breathe. Amen. And be social. Amen. Amen. One last question I would like for you guys to take a minute apiece and uh, answer this. What can the church do, particularly the black church, to promote mental health? I think we can do what we're doing right now. Um, we can acknowledge those opportunities that the world gives us by this being National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. You know, pastors been preaching about blinding your mind, and I think that that's important. Preaching sermons that are uh, that are in, um, in support of mental health. We can talk about mental health issues like grief and loss and depression you know, and anxiety and those things. We can make them more normative than you know, so that people can feel that it's okay. We can um, preach sermons about biblical characters yeah. who were depressed, Amen. who were suicidal. Come on. Absolutely. We can let the word inform our daily lives. Um, we can provide opportunities for discussion True. like this, you know, about what's really happening in a person's life. We can connect people to each other so they have a prayer partner and someone that they can call and talk to in the church should they have need. Those are some ideas I have. And that's why she's going to be amazing in coordinating our, uh, <laughs> our mental, mental health or well, our wellness area. We haven't come up with a formal name, but there are so many, uh, so many ways we can reach out, so many ways that uh, we can touch others. And one of the things that, that we want to do is educate. So education, 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 and encouragement. And so we'll be reaching out to the community. We'll be inviting the community to come in because it's so important. People are dying all around us, involuntarily and voluntarily. And so as a church, we are so key, and I always pray that we'll be a light on this corner to help people be whole, spirit, soul, and body. So education, hands-on um, interactions, forming these different kinds of groups, and, and being real with one another. Amen. Being real, hallelujah, with one another. Amen. So I'm excited about that. Amen. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. Those are all the questions I have for you. But <clears throat> the scripture tells us, I mean, and you, somebody's probably wondering, when are they going to ever get to the Bible today? But, <laughs> but I want to I draw your attention to something that, um, that Paul said to the Corinthian church. And I want you to look at the, the, the language that he used um, and then what he was actually in, encouraging us to do. Uh, he says, praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, Paul always, this is the way he started out his messages. But if you think about it, in the Old Testament and even some parts of the Old, New Testament, Jews always referred to God as the father of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which connects them to the lineage and Paul is purposefully saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a new identity. We have a new connection here. And then he goes on to say, the father of what? 
compassion. The father of compassion. The King James Version says the father of mercies. And when we say the father of mercies, we're talking about that deep awareness of, of the sympathy that's needed in your soul, that touching of the human to human touch, that sympathy where you recognize someone else's need of, of the emotional touch from you and that encouragement. And so he's a father of compassion and the God of all comfort. One thing I notice here, and this, I'm gonna, there's, I think, four verses, three through seven. In these four verses, one form of comfort is in there ten times. Ten times. And so one of, the, one of the definitions of comfort is just to be alongside the person. And that's just what you're just talking about. Even if you're, even if you're getting paid to sit there. <laughs> just, that's a form of comfort to just be alongside the person, to aid them to give them whatever they need. You're sensing. You're not just listening. Your limbic brain is at work. You're sensing what's, in, what's needed in them, and you're responding. Uh, and I like what Dr. Miriam said, that's, and praying it the whole time so that you can actually be in tune with, see, God knows what's going on in both of you, and he knows how to shift and make you aware of something else that you may need to say. And even if you don't know that you need to say it, how many of you said something and the other person said, that's exactly what I needed to hear? Anybody ever done that? And so God's at work doing all of this. And this is what Paul is getting to with this congregation he's writing to. He says, talking about the God of comfort, then he says, who comforts us in all our troubles. So in every single thing that you're going through, he's saying God comforts us. There is a comfort for it whatever your issues are, so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So God has this, um, this, this um, it's almost like a boomerang effect. You, <laughs> you, he gives comfort, and even when we say, God, I got comfort from God, it didn't fall out of the sky. A little cloud didn't come over and dump some comfort on you, you know, it still came through another human being. God comforts us through other human beings. And so Paul is writing to this specific audience and saying, God who comforts us, the team of people that he's working with, he's saying in all of our troubles that we're going through, he says, so that we can comfort you in trouble that you're going through. And so that's what happens with all of us we realize that God is at work in each one of us. We all are in the process of transformation, of being transformed into the image of God, into the image of Christ. And when we do that, together, we can handle anything. This is a phrase I came up with this morning. Is we will get through anything life throws at us when we do it together. Anything. When we've gone through stuff, say stuff. When you've gone through stuff and you go through stuff with other people who are in your corner, who want the best for you, who want you to succeed, who's looking for you to be better when you come out of this. When we go through that together, we can take anything that life throws at us. And Paul says, he goes on to say this, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, and he's talking about him, him and his team, as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Jesus Christ. Our comfort from him abounds. It's abundant. There is much more abundance of comfort that comes because of the things that we go through. And he goes on to say, if we're distressed, it's for your comfort. If our team is distressed, it's for your comfort and your salvation. If we are comforted, if somehow somebody comforts us, he's saying, it's for your comfort. <laughs> Everything we do is to bring you comfort, which produces in you, because that's the goal, the goal producing you the patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. So that you realize that together, anything that happens, we can make it, we'll go through this together. And then this last verse, this is how he says it. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. 
I want, to, I want to share this with you out of the Message Bible. It is just so right now. <laughs> he said, the Message Bible, P Peter, G Eugene says this, your hard times are also our hard times. When we see that you're just as willing to endure the hard times as to enjoy the good times, we know you're going to make it. No doubt about it. And that's our message to you today. No doubt about it. Together, we will make it, no doubt about it. So here's your challenge for today, and that's this. We want to engage in some activity, acts of exhortation as we exhort others. You don't have to be a therapist to do this. You don't have to be a therapist to encourage people. You don't have to be a therapist to comfort one another. But for the purpose of strengthening each other and transforming us, being a part of God's process of transformation, uh, into each one of us being in a unique image of Christ that only you can fit that image. But we all play a part and participate in that image. And so as we engage in those acts, in other words, you're relating, not just listening with your ears, not just, you know, even watching with your, watching facial expressions, even the expressions that we just showed you, but your heart and your emotions, you are touching inside you are you're actually touching the inside of that person with your inside yeah and and that is so so powerful we only think about that kind of stuff when we you know when we're in love and we feel it and your heartbeat changes well it changes when you're dealing with anybody based on how they're responding to what you are emanating and what you are letting out through your your limbic brain it's powerful so here's your challenge Understanding and embracing the importance of going through stuff together and never being alone. You should never go through stuff alone. Get somebody else involved. If you're the one that's going through, get somebody else involved. And whenever you sense someone else is going through something, then lend them a hand. Do something to go alongside them, as Paul is saying. Just be there. You don't always have to say something. Just be there. Um, and do that with every relationship that you have, starting, you know, from home first and then outwardly. But then here's the key. We don't just quote or give somebody a scripture, okay? I know we typically do that. But that's not what we do here, right? When someone's going through stuff, we don't just say, oh, here, take this scripture and read this three times a day. You know, we get in it with them. Get in there. Get in there with them. We don't just quote or give someone a comforting scripture to read, but we come alongside them to share our faith and our presence. It's good to know the scripture. But you don't just give somebody, here, take this. This is what, even when you say, I took this, and I, you know, I listened to this, I read this over and over, and the Lord just delivered me. All right. I won't, I'll stop. I think I'm meddling now. I'll stop meddling. All right. So this week, think of ways the church can support mental health and well-being in our community. Um, and the church is me and you, right? When I say church, it's not some organization that's making decisions. That's you and I. What can we do to support mental health and well-being in our community? What can we do in our community? Not just our geographical community because we are online also. So we want to encourage and engage with all of our community, our online community, our geographical community, and do what we can do. And here's the key here. Practice compassion with everyone that you encounter. Seek to understand others even if you disagree with their values. Sometimes when we know we have different values than other people, we back off. It's like, well, we don't even believe the same. We don't even think the same. Well, practice compassion with that person. And remember that every person that you encounter is of value to Jesus. God created them in his image. He didn't just create Christians in his image. I'm going to say it like the Baptist pastor say, say amen, somebody. <laughs> God didn't just create 
the people who were going to be Christians in his image. All humans are created in his image. So, treat everyone in a way that builds the hope of sharing the gospel at some point in your encounters with him. Treat them in a way that you don't kill your message. You don't kill your witness. Jesus said uh, in Acts uh, 1 and 8, you know, you will be witness of me. We are a witness of him. We are his witness. That is a witness of his love, of his grace, of his mercy, of his kindness. Even when you are upset, learn how to be a witness. In other words, God is what? Love. So make sure love and compassion is what's coming out of you. And, you know, sometimes the hardest people for us to do this with is our kids, because they, I guess they get on our nerves. I don't know. But, but, but let compassion come out first. I know you're upset and angry. Sometimes it's kids, sometimes it's a spouse, sometimes it's siblings. But let compassion come out first. Sometimes it's the you know, that's, it's the people that you are most comfortable with. Then we just, we just let go. We don't care how they feel, you know, just let it rip. But have compassion with those people and focus on building genuine relationships that reflect the love of God as you spend time with others. Amen? Amen. 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 So make sure you get this. I know I'm rushing through the end of this. Uh, we took more time today than we normally do, but I want you to get this. I want you to practice this. I want you to implement this, integrate this into your life this week. Do something different this week to the core that changes you and transforms you into the image of Jesus Christ. So I want to pray with you right now, and um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to invite you to, you to stay seated here with us on, on the uh, platform. But I'm going to invite everybody to just pray with us today, especially since this is a different kind of message today. Um, I, I invite you to connect with us. And I'm going to invite, when we dismiss, if you're here today and you'd like prayer, uh, especially with uh, Dr. Thomasine, Dr. Uh, Miriam can pray with you after we, they're off the platform. But if you're here and you would like for them to pray with you, you can come right down to our normal session over, section over here and receive prayer. Or just come up and talk to them. Um, they'll be ready to talk to you. But bow your heads now. If you're online, you can connect with us. Just um, scan the QR code and let us know that you'd like to connect with us. Whatever your needs are, you can indicate them there, and we will respond to you. So let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you today for this time. I thank you for um, these professionals sharing from their hearts from their experiences, so much of what we need daily, so much of what we need in our lives with each other, for each other, um, being a part of each other's lives. I thank you for everything that was shared, and I pray that those who are listening, those who will even watch this later, I pray, God, that their hearts will be open and ready to change, ready to begin a change ready to begin to think differently so that they can feel differently, so that they can respond and act differently and change their behavior and habits. So we honor you today and give you honor and praise for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.